we continue our discussion on vitamins and coenzymes and uh, what we learned yesterday was how these vitamins were actually transferred into cofactors that were utilized for the enzymes to go through their enzymatic mechanism. So, most complex enzymes would have a cofactor or a prosthetic group of a coenzyme which could be a metal ion, could be a small organic molecule and these vitamins are transferred transformed to these small organic molecules that are going to be used for the enzymatic reactions. Now, what we have here is uh, we considered some of the vitamins, we will go through all, all the rest of the ones today, where we have a certain important role that each of these play. Now, ATP is an extremely important coenzyme that helps in the for like the it helps in the non spontaneity of some reactions that actually have a positive delta G, but the high phosphate or high energy phosphate bond of ATP when broken gives a sufficient amount of negative energy, negative free energy that compensates for the positive delta G for a certain reaction. So, any reaction that requires ATP will break that high energy phosphate bond into forming ADP and PI and depending on whether there is a pyrophosphate required, it will then break and form into AMP plus PPI. We also have NAD which we will see today, FAD and FMN, each of these are used in redox reactions that play a very important role in the bioenergetic processes, okay, because each of these processes or each of these steps have redox reactions, certain enzymes that are used for these redox reactions and we will see how these vitamins are transformed into these coenzymes which can then be utilized for those reactions. We have coenzyme A which is another very, very important coenzyme. It is formed from pantothenic acid and is involved in acyl transfer. Then we have the thiamine which we just started off yesterday then pyridoxine that is involved in amino acid isomerization. Now, this is something that we looked at in our last class where we have thiamine that has to be transformed to thiamine pyrophosphate for its activity. As thiamine it cannot the enzyme cannot create use this as its cofactor. So, it has to be transformed. It is transformed by TPP synthetase which is nothing but thiamine pyrophosphate synthetase. This is thiamine, a pyrophosphate means it has two phosphate groups attached to it. And since it has this phosphate, it is obtained from ATP, ATP is in the process transformed into AMP. Now, these are some of the reactions that thiamine pyrophosphate is required for as a cofactor. These are decarboxylase reactions where CO2 is released, dehydrogenase reactions, another dehydrogenase reaction, also a transketolase reaction. But we, what we need to know is how later on when we get into the carboxylic acid cycles, we will see how pyruvate decarboxylate is required and in this case we will have TPP assist the enzyme in performing its activity. So, basically a reaction like this where you would have pyruvic acid, you have pyruvate decarboxylase which means that the CO2 is eliminated from the pyruvic acid forming acetaldehyde. Okay? And this reaction or this enzyme cannot act without TPP. Okay? and TPP cannot be formed without thiamine. Okay? So, that is the way the vitamins work. So, thiamine is transformed to TPP, TPP is utilized, this is one of the reactions where it is used, utilized for the decarboxylase activity, decarboxylation of pyruvate to form acetaldehyde and you recognize that, recognize that this is a breakdown, okay? you are breaking things down, you are, you are metabolizing these processes. This is another one where you are forming acetolactate synthase. So, you are forming acetolactate by the elimination of CO2. Again, this reaction requires TPP or this enzyme rather requires TPP for its action. Okay? So, 
if we get into the next family of vitamins vitamin B6 this vitamin again would be a small molecule a small organic molecule that again has to be transformed into the cofactor that is in the process in turn going to be used for an enzymatic reaction for its mechanism to be to take place. So, PLP is a prosthetic group for enzymes that catalyze reactions that involve amino acid metabolism. So, you would have amino acid isomerization, amino acid decarboxylation, side chain elimination or even replacement ok, because you recognize that the amino acids are synthesized in the body ok. So, there are certain enzymes that are going to be responsible for the synthesis of these amino acids and these enzymes require pyridoxal phosphate ok. So, if we look at pyridoxal phosphate this is a pyridine derivative ok. You recognize the pyridine moiety here and this is pyridoxine the specific groups attached to the pyridine nucleus the pyridoxal and the pyridoxamine these are the three forms of pyridoxine that are used in as cofactors in the enzymatic reactions. So, we have pyridoxine which is a pyridine derivative and we have several different groups this is the pyridoxine that has the CH 2 OH here it forms pyridoxal where this is CHO the aldehyde and this can form pyridoxamine where it is CH2 NH2 the rest of the substituents remain the same ok. So, we basically have the pyridine derivative. Now, the biochemical functions of this is it is actually able we will not go into the details of how it actually does this, but it as I mentioned in a previous slide where it is involved in amino acid metabolism, isomerizations, decarboxylations. So, this the role of pyridoxal phosphate is mainly to do with amino acids ok. So, any reaction that would involve amino acid metabolism, isomerization or breakdown of amino acid would require this PLP pyridoxal phosphate for. So, this is the pyridoxal which you recognize here now after this has formed a phosphate it becomes pyridoxal phosphate ok. So, again for the pyridoxal phosphate to form you have to have the pyridoxal ok. So, pyridoxal will form pyridoxal phosphate it is that PLP which will be used by the enzyme for the amino acid breakdown ok. This is the way so you have to recognize how each of the vitamins not by themselves are used by the enzymes, but after being transformed in some manner is used by the enzymes. This is another one we have vitamin B7 here biotin. Now, biotin actually is required it has to be supplemented in the diet, but it is required in small amounts because intestinal bacteria actually make biotin ok. So, you do not have to have as much biotin in your diet and there is a protein called avidin in raw eggs which binds biotin extremely tightly as a result of which it makes biotin unavailable for its enzymatic specific reaction. So, this avidin protein when binds to biotin makes biotin less available for its particular reaction right. So, if you cook an egg which is the which is why they say you should not have raw eggs. If you cook the egg you denature the protein you denature avidin and it does not bind biotin anymore. So, biotin is available for the enzymatic reaction that it catalyzes ok. So, what are these reactions that it catalyzes? We have biotin a prosthetic group. Now, what do we, me we mean by a prosthetic group? It is a group that attaches covalently with the enzyme that is what a prosthetic group is. This biotin actually catalyzes two sorts two sorts of reactions one is a carboxyl group transfer reaction where as the name specifies we it is possible for the transfer of a carboxyl group. We also have carboxylation reactions where we have ATP dependent 
carboxylation reactions. Okay? So, again biotin actually is required in very small amounts because it is made by intestinal bacteria and again it is bound tightly by avidin that may lead to biotin deficiency and it being a prosthetic group it catalyzes after it is linked with the enzyme it catalyzes carboxylic group transfer reactions and ATP dependent carboxylation reactions. So, how does it work? Biotin is actually linked by an amide bond okay, to the epsilon amino group of a lysine residue. What is that? It is this, this one in blue here is the protein. Okay. This is the NH2 group of lysine. You recognize the side chain? CH2, 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 CH2 and NH here and this is biotin, this part. This biotin is linked to the lysine. The reactive group of biotin is this nitrogen that is marked in red. Okay? So, what do you have? You have biotin which is this that is linked to lysine. Where is this lysine? This lysine is in the protein. Okay? So, whatever enzyme that is going to be acted upon or whichever enzyme actually has to perform its function that requires biotin will link with biotin and then have the biotin perform its function. Okay? So, you have to recognize again that the vitamin biotin is required. What is it going to do? It is going to link with the lysine. That means, the lysine that was present in the enzyme itself cannot perform its enzymatic mechanism without biotin, which is why we call these coenzymes or cofactors or prosthetic groups that assist the enzymes in their activity. These are not simple enzymes that can act just by the capability of their side chains to perform a reaction. They require these enzyme bound or cofactors or coenzymes associated with them for their specific reaction. For example, if we look at the reaction that is catalyzed by pyruvate carboxylase, the first thing is the formation of a carboxy biotin enzyme complex. In the formation of this carboxy biotin enzyme complex, it means that it requires the linking with the lysine residue in the enzyme, okay, because that is where the biotin is going to link. The second step has an enolate form of pyruvate that attacks the carboxyl group of the carboxy biotin forming oxaloacetate. Now, this reaction the pyruvate formation the enolate form of pyruvate going to oxaloacetate is a very important reaction in what is called the carbohydrate metabolism which we, we will see when we do bioenergetics. You will then recognize where each of these res, uh, enzymes come into play. Okay? Each of these enzymes because there are going to be different steps in the reactions, these different steps obviously have different enzymes and these different enzymes in turn have different cofactors the presence of which will then allow the enzymatic activities to take place. So, what happens here? is you have a bicarbonate and you have the biotin that is linked to the enzyme. Okay? Where is it linked? It is linked through the lysine. Okay? So, now it is linked here. Now, what is going to happen here? There is going to be an elimination of the OH. Once this, because this is the reactive center, this nitrogen is the reactive center. It will act on this carbon forming carboxy biotin eliminating the OH from the bicarbonate. Okay? So, that is the first step. So, after the biotin has linked with the enzyme, you have the bicarbonate ion here. This is the reactive nitrogen of the biotin that is going to form 
carboxybiotin. So, what does that look like? This is what carboxybiotin is. How did it form? It formed after the elimination of OH and how did that form? From the lone pair of uh, lone pair on the nitrogen present here. Okay? It goes and acts on this carbon eliminating the OH. Once that happens, you have carboxybiotin. Now, this carboxybiotin is now this is enol pyruvate. It is the enol form of pyruvate. Right? What is pyruvate? It is you have the CH3CO, COOH, that is what pyruvate is. This is the enolic form of the pyruvate. What is happening now is there is going to be the formation of oxaloacetate. What do we have? We have an additional carbon addition here. Okay? So, it is a carboxylase that is acting into adding a COO minus to enol pyruvate. So, what you are doing is you recognize that this is synthesizing something, right. So, this biotin with in conjunction with the enzyme, the enzyme alone cannot do this, okay. It has to have the biotin for this particular reaction to occur, okay. So, once this reaction occurs, this takes up the extra carbon and forms oxaloacetate, okay. And what happens to the biotin and the enzyme? It is back to where it started from. But you have to recognize it is exactly like the enzymatic mechanisms. The only thing that you need the additional prosthetic group in this case for the action of the enzyme. That is what is different in all of these cases. And as you recognize each of the vitamins are required for a particular reaction to take place. Okay? So, what is the next one? Pantothenic acid. This is vitamin B5. We are not going in a specific order like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It is just depending on how we are getting to the particular activities of the enzymes. Okay. Now, this is a very important vitamin. The reason being that it actually is the cofactor for what is called coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is well, it is used in a lot of the carbohydrate metabolism cycles there we have the tricarboxylic acid cycle there, we have a pentose phosphate cycle there, okay. there are glycolysis. All of these cycles that actually break up glucose or break up carbohydrates into forming small molecules that are again utilized for the synthesis in different other cycles to prepare the amino acids or other proteins that are required in the body. Okay? So, this pantothenic acid which the formula of which is given here, it serves in its activated form as again the cofactor for coenzyme A and also for the acyl carrier protein ACP. Now, the acyl carrier protein or coenzyme A also is one that transfers an acyl group. Transferring an acyl group means you are transferring CH3CO, which means you are transferring two carbon atoms at a time. Okay? So, if you are synthesizing a fatty acid, you remember I told you that they always are synthesized by two carbon atoms at a time. Okay? And this is where some of these come into play. This is what is coenzyme A. Okay? You recognize that this is a sugar this is a base and it has the pantothenic acid part on top here. What is the pantothenic acid part? This is the pantothenic acid part, the CONH that is here, the CONH part here and the way we actually consider it is we just put this wavy line here because this is common and we write this as acetyl CoA. This COCH3 at the end of acetyl CoA is what is transferred. Okay? So, it is involved in a lot of acylation reactions where you are transferring two carbon atoms. Okay? So, this is the structure of coenzyme A and what we need to know is this is SH. This becomes acetyl-CoA where the H has been replaced by 
COCH3. Okay, you see this COCH3 that has replaced this hydrogen of coenzyme A. So, coenzyme A comes into the picture. How do you get coenzyme A? If you use pantothenic acid. Pantothenic acid in its activated form is part of coenzyme A that then forms acetyl CoA as it is called and this is involved again in a number of reactions. What are these? Coenzyme A it performs a vital role by transporting acetyl groups from one substrate to another and the reason why this is extremely important as I keep mentioning is because you can transfer two atoms at a time. Okay. In the previous ones that we look at we were transferring only a COO minus that was one carbon you went from enol pyruvate to oxaloacetate. In this case you can go by two carbons because you are transferring an acyl group. Okay. The key to this reaction is the reactive thioester bond in the acetyl form of CoA. What is the this is acetyl CoA? This is your thioester bond. Okay. What is an ester bond? A COO R and this is an SCO. So, it is a thioester. The thioester bond, this is important, is stable enough so that it survives in the cell. But at the same time, it can also be broken up under suitable conditions to give the CH3CO. Okay? So, it is extremely important in the way the enzyme would work into either breaking it up to get the CH3CO or at the same time surviving inside the cell. So, it can be taken up by the specific enzyme as and when required. For example, this is an example of an acetylation reaction. We have heard about choline when, when we did the fatty acids and the triglyceride phosph the phosphoglycerides. What happened? This the choline we had phosphatidylcholine that formed a part of a polar head group to a lipid, right? When we have the hydrophobic tails that are formed by the two fatty acids and we have a polar head group. It was this choline that was at the time one of the polar head groups for some of the phosphoglycerides. Now, this forms acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is an extremely important neurotransmitter. Okay? It transforms all the messages, most of the messages to the brain for whatever activities are going on. Okay? So, this the choline that is present can be transferred to acetyl choline by acetyl coenzyme A that transfers its acetyl group to acetyl choline in the event becoming coenzyme A. Okay? So, you recognize that the choline being present with the acetyl CoA will form acetylcholine that as I mentioned is an extremely important neurotransmitter in our nervous system. Okay? It helps in the transmission of messages that is completely another chapter and is extremely interesting as to how messages go from one they are all neurotransmitters we have chemical messengers and these are the chemical messengers that actually take the message from other parts of your body to your brain. Vitamin B2, riboflavin. What we have here is we have a heterocyclic flavin, we will see what that is in a moment, linked to a ribose analogous to the nucleosides in RNA. We now know what a nucleoside is. What is a nucleoside? You have a sugar linked to the base, that is a nucleoside it becomes a nucleotide as soon as you have a phosphate linked to it. It is an orange yellow fluorescent compound found in green leafy vegetables, milk and meats. It is heat stable, but destroyed by light and we have an RDA that is the recommended daily or dietary allowance, which is so many milligrams per day, but we have to be interested in the structure of riboflavin. This is what is riboflavin. Okay? 
it is what is called a dimethyl that is the dimethyl you see here isoaloxazine this is the isoaloxazine ring system okay and this imparts a planarity to the molecule you have a benzene moiety here okay so this you know is planar so impart some planarity to the molecule and because of the large number of nitrogen atoms here it also has a yellowish color to it okay so this is what is called your dimethyl isoaloxazine ring system and this is your riboflavin this is the vitamin now what do we have to do to the vitamin to get it to act it has to be transformed into a cofactor only if it's transformed to a cofactor can it then help an enzyme to perform its specific function okay so now we're going to see how this can be transformed into a cofactor that is going to be of any use to the body or to the specific enzymes that are going to need riboflavin okay here there are two cofactors actually involved now these cofactors are extremely important in some of the glycolysis or glycolytic reactions that take place we have riboflavin phosphate which is also called flavin mononucleotide the nucleotide means it has the phosphate okay fmn that is flavin mononucleotide so it has the riboflavin and it is a phosphate we have flavin adenine dinucleotide okay that means what is adenine now we now have a purine base attached to it okay we will see what the structure is in a moment but this is an extremely important cofactor fmn and fad because they are involved in the metabolism of carbohydrates something that we will study after we do when we do our bioenergetics part okay so it is involved in the metabolism of carbohydrates fats and protein so it is this vitamin is required for the breakdown of a lot of our dietary constituents okay and they also act as hydrogen carriers in the respiratory chain so not only do they act as a metabolism of the carbohydrates fats and proteins they are also involved in hydrogen carriers in the respiratory chain so if we just go back to the structure once more this is your riboflavin which is vitamin b2 the two cofactors that it actually forms are fmn and fad so these are what are going to be required in the specific enzymes that are involved in these processes here okay so what do we have this is your isoaloxazine group okay this is riboflavin this part the one in yellow and blue together okay then when you have a mononucleotide attached to the riboflavin you see a phosphate i have a clearer picture on the next slide but the picture here is you that you have a phosphate you have the riboflavin attached to the phosphate riboflavin phosphate okay riboflavin phosphate is the phosphate attached here if the phosphate is attached here this becomes riboflavin phosphate that is also known as flavin mononucleotide fmn okay when you attach this to amp adenosine monophosphate you have the adenine ring here the ribose sugar the nucleotide with the phosphate here this becomes flavin because this is the flavin part adenine dinucleotide okay let's look at the next slide this is what we're talking about this is our riboflavin part when this was ch2oh till here okay you are now attaching the phosphate when you attach the phosphate it becomes riboflavin 
phosphate that is F M N. When you attach the adenine the AMP part what is AMP? Adenine the sugar CH2 and the phosphate it becomes flavine adenine dinucleotide. Why dinucleotide? Because you have two of these now. Okay. So, what do we have once more? When I form F M N. I am forming F M N. This is up to here is my riboflavin part. This part is my riboflavin part. Right? That is my vitamin. When I take in this, it becomes F M N riboflavin phosphate. When I consider this along with it, I have adenine, I have a sugar, I have a phosphate, it is AMP. So, when I have the FMN with the AMP, it forms FAD. Okay? So, you have the riboflavin part, the phosphate part that forms FMN. this plus this part which is AMP forms F A D. Okay? So, you need vitamin B 2 to form all this okay? because only if you have the vitamin B 2 in its riboflavin part will you be able to form its phosphate. Then you will it be able to act with the AMP to form the adenine dinucleotide. Okay? So, that is what it is. So, basically what happens is you have an FAD. So, what is our FAD? This is our FAD. Okay? Now, it becomes FADH2. So, it acts with dehydrogenases. You have a reduced substance that can be transformed to an oxidized substance with FAD, FADH2. Where are these hydrogens taken up? One by this nitrogen, one by this nitrogen. Okay? So, it can act as FAD, FADH and FADH2. Okay? So, it can take it up in steps, which is important when you want to do a certain reaction. We will not go into probably very much detail of the electron transport chain. But you have to recognize that any of these dehydrogenases, because if you are taking a substance that has to release its hydrogens, the hydrogens have to go somewhere. Okay? So, some moiety has to take up the hydrogens. It is this FAD that does that. It takes up the hydrogens. Okay? So, this is the oxidized form, the rest of the, so this is what? This is the isoaloxazine ring. This is the hydrogen addition that can take place in two steps. So, what do we have here? We have FAD that is now FADH2 and where have the hydrogens been added? One to this nitrogen and one to this nitrogen. Okay? So, we have riboflavin form the phosphate then form FAD and the FAD can add the hydrogen from any substance or any chemical moiety that is present that is going to release the hydrogen atoms. Okay? FAD will take that up and form FADH2. Now, these are some of the enzymes that require riboflavin cofactors. You see there are all sorts. And what are these all these enzymes? They are all redox type ones, dehydrogenase, oxidase, reductase, oxidase. All of these are ones that re are required or have to perform a redox reaction. Okay? Now, in per performing the redox reaction, we need the FAD. Okay? This is another one. We have succinate forming fumarate. 
what is happening here? It is ridding itself of these two hydrogens. The CH2 here and the CH2 here is becoming CH double bond CH. So, two hydrogens have to get lost. Who is taking them up? FAD. Okay. FAD in conjunction with the enzyme is taking up the two hydrogens forming in the process forming FADH2 and forming fumarate. So, there has to be another reaction that takes place in the enzymatic cycle that is going to do what? It is going to transform FADH2 back to FAD. Right? It is not this reaction that is going to do it because this reaction has already formed FADH2, but it has to be some other reaction in the cycle that is going to form the FAD back again because that has to be utilized by this enzyme again. It is a cycle remember. Okay? So, that is how we are going to see exactly how all of this takes place later on. This is another one that use FMN. What are we doing here? We are performing forming FMNH2 where we have actually H2O and ammonia. Okay. The next one vitamin B3. This is nicotinic acid and nicotinamide. Again, the two forms that are required here are NAD and NADP. Okay. So, again, you I hope you realize that each of these vitamins are being transformed into something okay? and that is what is being used by the enzyme. So, again for this vitamin it has to be transformed to a certain cofactor and what are those cofactors? We have the two cofactors of niacin are NAD and NADP. These cofactors are not very tightly held by the enzyme and they are used reaction after reaction. Okay? It is very smartly organized. What does it look like? We have if you look at the name nicotinamide, this is nicotinamide. Nicotinamine A is adenine dinucleotide, nicotinamine adenine dinucleotide. This is nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide. This is the dinucleotide form because you have the base, the sugar, the phosphate. What is here? The base, the sugar, the phosphate. Nicotinamide is one, adenine is the other linked by this two phosphates, dinucleotide. Okay? So, you have a nicotinamide that is in its oxidized form that can be also in its reduced form if it takes up an H here. So, you can have NAD, you can have NADH. Okay? If there is a phosphate at this position, it forms NADP okay? because this already has the phosphate. If at the 2 prime hydroxyl, you have a phosphate it is NADP. Okay? So, you should be able to recognize just from this structure what it is. You recognize that there are two nucleotides here. You recognize that this is adenine. You also recognize that this is nicotinamide. So, this is nothing but nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide okay? NAD. If you just follow the nomenclature, you will never go wrong. Okay? We have nicotinamide, we have adenine, we have dinucleotide, NAD. If it has to be NADP, then it is going to be phosphorylated at the 2 prime position. Okay? This again is involved in a bunch of reactions. So, this is what it looks like. What is this? The nicotinamide, this are the 2 phosphates and this is the adenine. So, if you do not take in this vitamin, you do not have the nicotinamide, you cannot form the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and you cannot get into the reactions that it actually looks at, actually assists basically. So, we have NAD plus or NADP plus that can form NADH. 
So, it can take in an extra hydrogen at this position. Okay? This is vitamin B12. We are not going into any of the details of vitamin B12, just that since we were doing the vitamins, this is cyanocobalamin and it has the cobal, cobalt atom here and the cyanide group here and it has this big structure and it is vitamin B12. But we will not, not look at what vitamin B12 actually does. We will go on to look at vitamin C. Okay? So, again vitamin C, this is ascorbic acid. It has to be used again in some reaction. So, it has to be transformed into a cofactor. So, what we have to know is what it is going to be transformed into. The specific reactions that it actually goes into is the production and maintenance of collagen. Collagen is required in our muscles. Okay? It forms the long fibers in the muscles. So, it actually transforms the proline into hydroxyproline and lysine into hydroxyl lysine and it is also used in the electron transport chain that is part of the respiratory chain. Okay? The ones, the usual ones that we looked at before, most of them like FMN, FAD, most of them apart from their use in the, some of them are used in the electron transport chain, they are mostly used in the carbohydrate metabolism, okay? the breakdown of the carbohydrates. So, we have ascorbic acid, this is another one, I am just giving you the names, as I have told you, you do not necessarily need to remember the formula, but if you just look at folic acid, if you look at this moiety, you recognize that it is a part of the nucleus and some of the purine carbons are actually derived from the folate. So, we have adenine and guanine that are actually derived from the folate and again in a set of enzymatic reactions. Okay? So, the adenine and the guanine are synthesized in the body. Okay? They will link with the sugar to form a nucleoside which will link with the phosphate to form a nucleotide. But the vitamin parts that are going to form the cofactors have to be supplemented in the diet. Okay? So, to prepare this we need the folic acid, right? this part is made in the body, but this will be made in the body if you consume the folic acid. right? So, that is how these work. Again we have the fat soluble vitamins, these are soluble in lipids vitamins A, D, E and K and they usually are stored in the fatty tissues of the body and in the liver. Okay? So, let us look at where these will come into play. Vitamin A, retinol, it not only functions in our visual pigments which is extremely important for our visual activities going into the details of how that works is beyond what we have to do in this course, but again it is an ex extremely interesting topic as to how retinol actually is involved in the visual pigments, but it also functions in the synthesis of certain glycoproteins. This is something we have studied before, where we have looked at glycoproteins means we have proteins linked with carbohydrates. And retinol also helps in the synthesis of those glycoproteins and mucopolysaccharides. We did hyaluronic acid, which is a mucopolysaccharide that is necessary for mucus production and normal growth regulation. So, apart from its activity in visual pigments, it is also involved in the synthesis of glycoproteins. And retinoic acid also, which is the acid form of this. This is retinol, when this forms retinoic acid, it is also involved in cellular differentiation, it controls cellular growth. Okay? So, because you have already read that vitamin A, the deficiency of it is going to cause night blindness, it is good for your eyes and so on and so forth, it is also good for a number of other activities here. So, vitamin A is involved not only in your uh, visual pigments, but also in your glycoproteins and in cell growth. Vitamin D, 
vitamin D actually has two precursor forms as it is called which is something that is prior to when vitamin D is formed. Okay. It is actually a steroid hormone and it the precursor form one of them is 7 dehydrocholesterol. So, it is involved in cholesterol formation and where do we need this cholesterol? In the lipid membrane for the fluidity. Remember apart from the, the hydrophobic uh, tails and the polar heads, there was also these additional cholesterol moieties that fitted into the with the hydrophobic tails to form what? To give some sort of fluidity to the membrane. This UV irradiation affords cholecalciferol that is vitamin D3 and ergocalciferol. So, actually vitamin D, there are two precursor forms that are actually there in the body and vitamin D is formed from these with UV irradiation. Okay? So, if you sit in the sun or you have UV radiation basically, then these two precursor forms actually can form cholesterol. Okay? So, this is actually what happens. We have 7 dehydrocholesterol that is if you remember the cholesterol uh, structure, this was part of the cholesterol structure where we had the steroid nucleus. Remember we had a steroid nucleus and on UV radiation you get pre vitamin D. Now, what you need to know from this is that vitamin D actually is not a vitamin in that sense or a cofactor. Okay? There is something called 7 dehydrocholesterol and ergosterol that are two precursor forms of vitamin D okay? and this is actually a steroid hormone that is required, it is formed in the liver and then it is converted in the kidney. Okay? So, this is what we have done so far. We have looked at the structures of each of these okay? and what you have to recognize is that for all of the vitamins that are supplemented in the diet, each of them have a specific role to play in the sense that you have niacin. What does niacin do? It forms nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide. Okay? Now, how is that formed now? If we go, let us go one by one. First of all, let us start with ATP. ATP means that you have adenosine triphosphate. Okay? It is not formed from any vitamin, okay? but the, it has obviously each of these have a role. Its role is in energy and phosphate transfer. How does it do that? Because each of the high energy bonds that are broken especially the gamma phosphate bond that is broken is going to give us minus 30 kilojoules per mole of energy. So, this ATP that is adenosine triphosphate, where does this adenosine come from? It is one of the adenine base which is a nitrogenous base belonging to the purine family that is going to be linked to a ribose sugar linked to a ribose sugar means we are going to have something that looks like this. We have our ribose sugar which has the OH and the OH. We have our base linked here. So, this is where our adenine is linked right? and to this we have our three phosphates. These phosphates, so we have 1, 2, 3. Now, what happens is this breakdown is going to result in a delta G that is negative. So, what usually happens is this 
is coupled with another reaction that has a delta G positive. So, that the overall is a negative making this non spontaneous reaction a spontaneous reaction. Okay? This will be very clear when we do the bioenergetics and you will see how cleverly the reactions are coupled together. The next one that we looked at was niacin. What is niacin? We require niacin to form nicotinamide. Nicotinamide is then going to link with nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay? You see how adenine comes into the picture a number of times. Okay? Riboflavin. Riboflavin has the isoaloxazine group to it. Okay? It will when it is phosphorylated it forms riboflavin phosphate which is FMN. This linked to adenosine monophosphate AMP gives FAD. NAD and FAD are each involved in redox reactions because they can take up hydrogen atoms. Okay? FAD can do it in two steps. So, we can have FAD, FADH2. Okay? So, we can have a CH2, CH2 single bond form a CH, CH, CH double bond CH. Okay? Just because it can, because the hydrogens have to go somewhere. Pantothenic acid was involved in coenzyme A and acetyl coenzyme A. What does that do? It can have, it has rather an important role in acyl transfer. Thiamine is involved in the transfer of two carbons or we can have the CO2 transfer there. How we looked at how pyruvate formed acetaldehyde that is by a certain enzyme that would use TPP. Using TPP means you have to have thiamine to form TPP. Again vitamin B6 pyridoxine which will form pyridoxal phosphate which is used in amino acid isomerization. So, each of the vitamins that we have have a role in the formation of cofactors, coenzymes. Once these cofactors are formed, we did not mention biotin in this list, but biotin is also there which is a prosthetic group that links to the enzyme. Then together with the enzyme, it performs the enzymatic function and that completes our discussion on vitamins and coenzymes. We will go on to nucleic acid structures in our next class followed by bioenergetics and metabolism of carbohydrates. Thank you.